Well, good morning and welcome back to our conference on weathering the coming storm. And uh, we hope you had a good rest after last night's session. Hope you slept well on that disturbing news. But uh, we are here for the second session on uh, the uh, <laughs> the second session on the national predicament. We talked about the glo- I took a global perspective yesterday, but now we're going to focus on the national predicament. We're just going to zero right on down, as you can tell from your program. And so uh, uh, we will be entering, of course, the Word of God in this presentation. And we always want to do that armed with His presence and with prayer. So let's bow our hearts. Father, we thank You for this morning. We thank You for the privilege of being right here. We know, Father, that in Your kingdom there are no accidents, no coincidences, that we're all here by Your divine appointment. So it's our prayer, Father, that your purpose would be accomplished in each of our lives. In this coming hour, we commit this hour and ourselves into your hands. In the name of Yeshua, our kinsman redeemer, our reigning king, we thank you, Father, for our redeemer indeed, in whose name we commit all these things. Amen. He promises that where two or three are gathered together in the midst of us, and we, value, we just welcome that, value that, and trust Him to deal with some very troublesome issues. Uh, one reason we put this conference together uh, is the urgency. We clearly are on the threshold of a storm. And we say that broadly. No matter where you are in the world, you'll be impacted by the events that we're dealing with. And so we're going to, we focused on the broader horizon as a warm-up last night, we're now going to spend on the, uh, we're going to focus on the national perspective here, if we may. And so we're going to talk about the life cycle of nations. Many people don't realize that nations have a life cycle. They start and they go through a cycle and they end. And uh, we're go- we want to understand the nature of the fall of nations and distinguish between the symptoms and the real cause in all of that. Life cycle of nations. It's interesting how that has been studied and studied and studied through the centuries, and the conclusions are pretty much identical. Uh, Alexander Tyler, back in 1770, published The Cycle of Democracy, and we'll, we'll d- dwell on his model in a minute. Edward Gibbon, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, classic, most of you are familiar with. Um, Toynbee's study of history back in 34, and Jode in 36, and then uh, Jim Nelson Black, When Nations Die in 1994. What's interesting, if you study each of these, you'll discover the conclusions are quite consistent. No surprises, pretty straightforward. I'll use Jim Black's summary as the summary of all of them. There's social decay, which is usually a crisis, lawlessness. That's different than breaking the law, the fact that the laws are ineffectual. The loss of economic discipline and rising bureaucracy. These things seem painfully familiar, don't they? Sounds like it's out of an editorial of today's newspaper. Uh, Cultural decay, the decline of education. It's astonishing to discover that the decline of education is not accidental or mismanagement, it's by design. I hope you don't believe that and check it out. You have to for that yourself. The weakening of cultural foundations, the loss of respect for traditional values. It's amazing to discover how the Bible, from cover to cover, admonishes, it said, don't move the ancient landmark. And it's not talking about property landmark, it's an idiom, a metaphor for much broader commitments, that there's a, there's a comfort, a, a stability and tradition that is, that is constructive. And the loss of respect for traditional values accompanies the fall of nations. And of course, the real root of all of this is moral decay. The rise of immorality, we're going to talk a little bit about that as we go. The decay, of course, of religious belief of whatever kind. And uh, devaluing of human life goes along with this. These are fundamentals that, the, uh, that authors have noted throughout the centuries. Alexander Tyler speaks of the cycle of nations in a way that I think is so descriptive, I, I just have to indulge in it. People start in bondage, and while in bondage, they attain some measure of spiritual faith. That spiritual faith leads to courage. And from that courage, they can attain at least some level of liberty. And that liberty then leads to abundance. That's a pattern. And that certainly is the profile of America. It did, it, the, the, the liberty there led to an abundance that became the envy of the world. Watch out for that 
watch out for envy. It's dangerous. From that abundance, what happens? Well, you pretty soon get to complacency. And from that complacency, it degenerates into apathy. And I'm, I'm fond of quoting this. I go down the street in America and ask somebody, what do you think the biggest problem is in America? Is it, is it uh, ignorance or is it uh, apathy? And he'll say, I don't know and I don't care. <laughs> and of course, that apathy then leads to dependency. And even in America, with all its pride of so many other things, over 50% of the population is on the dole with the government in some way or another. There's an entitlement mentality that has taken over the culture. And uh, that, ha- that has disastrous consequence, which of course leads back into bondage. That closes the cycle. That cycle throughout history usually takes about two centuries. Give or take a little, about 200 years is the typical cycle. And that's the cycle in America. And it's a little overdue in a sense. So have you ever wondered why governments always seem to tend toward corruption? That's a phenomenon we observe. And as a systems engineer, I never understand it until I close the loop, if you will. You see, why are we surprised? Governments have always loved crises, right? They provide the rationale for increasing budgets and bureaucracies subjugating the liberties of the population. That's what these things, that's why they're useful to governments. You can, if you, if you have a, a, a crisis, that gives you an excuse to increase budgets and also to steal freedoms from the population. In fact, you notice when new dictators take over a country, they almost always create an external crisis, a military crisis, to consolidate their own power, obviously. And what they've discovered in America is that the that the, you don't have to have a military crisis. You see, social crises are just as useful to create an excuse to increase budgets and to steal liberties. And so, so there's an insight here that we should not overlook. If social crises are useful to a government, what causes social crises? And the answer is immorality. Immorality is what results in social crises. So let's diagram this as a system engineer would. The government, they love military crises because that increases their budgets and allows them to steal freedoms. Well, we've discovered in America, at least, that social crises are just as useful as military ones. And so what creates social crises? Immorality. Okay, no surprise. Why are we surprised when we realize that governments have an incentive to promote immorality? They should they 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 distribute free of charge condoms, or whatever you can th- you can make a whole list of things that governments do that in effect lead to immorality, which will lead to social crises, which will help the government. You say, well, that that sounds a little sinister. No kidding, it's, uh, that shouldn't rule it out of a government's cri- uh, agenda. There anyway. So what happens? These things grow and get bigger. Budgets get bigger, crises get larger, and the liberties get smaller. And so, but we have, so we've looked last night at a lot of different crises, but I'm going to take the big one is the corruption in America. And I'm going to use America because I know it best. I'm going to use America because what happens there will impact everybody in one way or another worldwide, unfortunately. And so what, what am I talking about? See, for decades now, we, we've papered over these problems with massive amounts of borrowing. But now our debts exceed 500% of the gross domestic product, and America is now the world's largest borrower. We were the world's largest creditor up until about 40 years ago. Now we're not only a debtor, we are the largest debtor by far on the planet Earth. And uh, the holes in our society can no longer be hidden. So it's not just the finances I'm dealing with here. For de- and so uh, there's an impending implosion. And we've lost our sense of honor humility, and the dedication to personal responsibility that used to be part of our tradition for more than 200 years. And we, that made our country, for, in the minds of many people, the, the brightest hope for mankind because of that root. And now we have become a country who believe their well-being is somebody else's responsibility. That's a huge fundamental change in the psyche and the mentality of the succeeding generations. Something you don't change back very quickly. 
Lies and abuse of exploitation by our high, highest officials go unchallenged. We have bald-faced lies continually flowing from the highest levels of our government. And the scripture has a lot to say about that. When the wicked rule, the people mourn. And we have lies and deceit and, and illegal actions openly practiced by the highest levels in our government. And that gets replicated all the way down the hill. You can even see this all the way down to the lowering of school standards, the, re the revising of the SAT scores, the widespread use of performance-enhancing drugs in professional college and high school sports even. And uh, cheating has become a way of life in America. I spent 30 years on Wall Street in, in, as director of public corporations, a dozen of them. And those were different days back then. I'm way out of date today. The kind of conduct that is standard on, on uh, Wall Street today was unheard of, except in rare exceptions a few decades ago. My word is my bond was the ethic that came from the street, and it worked for our, a good part of our history. And today, people, executives, you know, so sue me. It's a litigative environment. See, liberty is not the license to do what one wants. It's the empowerment to do what one ought Big difference. Big difference. Liberty is the harvest yielded from lives of individuals who plant the seed of self-government within as the foundation of thoughts and intents, words, and the deeds of life. That used to be our root ethic that we've built the country on. The fruit of liberty is, the, is national prosperity in all its multicolored forms. However, the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. Because it is within the nature of those who are enslaved to their own desires and fears to yearn to enslave others. And that's the dynamic that's going on. If you get enough money together, you can get a totally unknown person into the White House. You can mask the, the, uh, the pursuit of truth of all the mainline media if you have enough money and put a, a non-event into the... Anyway... On January 1st of 2012, New Year's Eve, what will be remembered as the most traitorous executive signing ever committed against the American people, President Obama signed a bill on New Year's Eve which essentially eliminated the sacred Bill of Rights. The Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, these were sacred documents in our culture, so much so, even as a kid you got tired of hearing about it. It was so inculcated in our culture. And today, there's probably a young person that knows next to nothing about any one of those three. And in any case, they've been obliterated by executive order New Year's Eve. In what was called the National Defense Authorization Act, there's been an NDAA every year. This one had a little subtle change in wording. Derived from the sacred principles of common law, and that's something else, by the way, I encourage every one of you to do a little homework and understand the difference between civil law and common law. The traditional form of law throughout the empire, from Re Roman Empire on, was to protect the state. We call that civil law. The innovation that emerged out of English common law is so precious, we need to understand its preciousness and its uniqueness. Because it's designed to protect the individual against the state. There's a, the, there's a tension between common law and civil law that you need to understand, and it's, it's something that every citizen should do a little bit of homework on. Anyway, the, the, from the sacred principles of common law, the Bill of Rights had, had, has come to a sudden and catastrophic end with the president signing the National Defense Authorization, Authorization Act. It's a law that grants the U.S. military, we're not talking, we're, they, they were never used for law enforcement before. No, now they have the legal right to conduct secret kidnappings of U.S. citizens, followed by indefinite detention, interrogation, torture, and even murder. And if that doesn't shock you, you weren't listening. This is all conducted completely outside the protection of law, with no jury, no trial, no legal representation, and not even any requirement that the government produce evidence against the accused. He can just disappear without any recourse. It's a system of outright government tyranny against the American people, and it effectively nullifies the Bill of Rights. This is not a proposal. This is not just a threat. This has happened. It's signed. It's in place. 
So we have a, a, the evaporation of the very roots that America was built upon, the separation of powers. There's no separation of powers. The, the executive branch totally ignores the legislative and the judiciary and, uh, and vice versa. The rule of law is no longer operative in America, believe it or not. Check it out yourself. Habeas corpus, posse comitatus, these were sacred principles of the past. Gone. Done. Trial by jury. No longer necessary. And common law versus civil law. I do encourage you to do some homework on that issue. There's corruption throughout the executive branch. We have a president in the White House who, can't, who is clearly prohibited from being there by the U.S. Constitution. He has denied any evidence of his eligibility for the office, setting aside many, many other uh, aspects of that. The legislative branch is astonishing, signing bills they don't read. They should all be on trial for treason, bluntly. They all took an office, uh, oath of office to protect the Constitution, and they ignore it. Th those, those are treasonous steps that every, virtually every one of them are guilty of. And the judiciary. It's astonishing to understand how the judiciary will reverse jury trials, will ignore legislative uh, uh, votes on, on uh, laws that should be established. They're, uh, totally, and there's a recourse that they are also vulnerable to um, impeachment they, in the early days. They could still be today if they had the political will within the legislature. To, to, there, there is recourse that's not resorted to. The judiciary is unbridled and destroying the country. And uh, the media, you know, everybody in public life has discovered that the media has a liberal bias. No surprise. That's been that way all along, probably, for a lot of reasons. But something different happened in the election of 2008 in the United States. Because all five of the mainline media conspired to hide the truth from the American people. That's not bias. That's treasonous conduct. The purpose of the media is to inform the electorate of an, in a democracy. And they deliberately hid the truth of the primary candidate. That's also a, should be a treasonous offense. There's one voice in America that has dedicated his life to the principle that the media's role is to be a watchdog of the government. And that organization is headed by an Arab. Our favorite Arab, I might add, Joseph Farah and World Net Daily, is a lone voice in the, as a megaphone of, the, of freedom and liberty and the, and, and the root causes of truth. And he's fortunately joined by some others, but he's the conspicuous example. And Wall Street, I spent a good part of my executive career on Wall Street, and let me tell you, it was different back then. I'm, I'm astounded to, to watch the, the change of atmosphere, ethical atmosphere, between the street as it was a few decades ago. I'm, ob I'm obviously out of date. It's astonishing to see the, the deceit and the uh, skullduggery that occurs in, the, in, the, in Wall Street today. And, of course, the schools. Uh, I used to think that, I, I noticed that every year is a, a, we spend more money per student hour and the results get worse. We always spend more money and the results get worse. I used to think that was just mismanagement. I was shocked to discover, as I started investigating that some years ago, to discover, no, that's the plan. They're following an agenda. It's all published. Read the books. As many of them written, uh, Bert Chose's book, uh, Brave New Schools, and others like that. That is the, that was the, uh, when uh, David Brees wrote the book, The Seven Men Who Ruled the World from Their Graves, he includes John Dewey as one of them, and the whole agenda of dumbing down the American publication to make it a more manageable electorate was an agenda that they're following. And I hope that shocks you enough to check it out. It's amazing to realize that the school uh, de 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 degeneration is a deliberate managed result. And so... And the unionization of public officials. You know, the concept of unions makes sense when there's an offsetting control. If you have a skilled labor force that's doing, that is working against some objective measure, the objective measure becomes the marketplace. When that, when that uh, uh, 
group of skills it gets too expensive to be productive, it's self-correcting in a sense, in, a, in an aggregate economic sense. But when you unionize a group of people who have no objective measure, and that's true of a cer certainly true of public officials, you unleash an escalation of cost that will come back to haunt you. And so the whole idea of unionizing public officials is a contradiction in terms when you study it through. And that, of course, has destroyed the entire public environment in the United States. I can remember as a kid that people who served uh, in public service did so at a penalty. Their salaries would not be as high as they could get in the corporate world, but they did it out of a sense of dedication and commitment. They found a sense of fulfillment in being a public servant in the true sense of the term. And uh, it, used to, it used to be when you went to Washington, you were frustrated because you had bureaucrats that were moving a little too slowly or something, but they weren't hostile. Today you go into the bureaucracies and you find aggressive young attorneys out to make a name for themselves who have no interest in the public interest except as a, as a, as a uh, cover. So the, anyway, it's ch the th things changed. And just to keep you, as we start talking about, I want to remind you about my lesson from yesterday of the lessons in quantities. How much is a million seconds? That turns out to be 12 days. Well, how much is a billion seconds? That turns out to be 32 years, which I argue is qualitatively different, not just a different magnitude numerically. And if you go to trillion, that's 32,000 years. The thing that should grab you out of this is that those changes in magnitude are so gigantic as to not be comparable qualitatively. Well, we take a look at our debt. We, we, at the end of 2011, we had 6.8 trillion in treasury debt, 8.2 trillion in government agency debt, 2.7 trillion in municipal debt, 11.6 trillion of corporate debt, 14.6 trillion in mortgage debt, 2.5 trillion in consumer debt, plus 6.5 trillion in other debts. That's 52.9 trillion, uh, uh, call it 53 trillion total. And that's out of the flow of funds in the United States. And that doesn't count future obligations, such as Social Security, Medicare, which add up to over $65 trillion. And on top of all of this, the U.S. banks hold derivative obligations that are impossible to fully assess. They clearly exceed $200 trillion, and some estimates go over $1,000 trillion in, in effective overhang on the economy. And that's from the Office of the Controller of the Currency, by the way. So this debt is impacting over half of all the U.S. states and thousands of our counties, cities and towns. And uh, the police, fire, and other emergency services are being cut. And health care services are being limited or eliminated altogether. And uh, schools and universities are losing their funding and they're forced to raise their tuition, which is already sky high. And the maintenance of roads, bridges, and, and uh, electrical grids are being curtailed. There are actually many counties that are plowing up their paved roads to put a, make them gravel because that's cheaper than trying to maintain the potholes and stuff that occur from the weather. They're at, we're actually going backwards in the infrastructure that made the country great. Part of the history of America was the upgrading of the, infra, the making, creating the infrastructure that created the prosperity of the past. We can't afford it, so they're actually going the other way, believe it or not. It turns out to be cheaper to do that. And uh, thousands of state, county, and city jobs are being cut, and there are prisons that are being opened. There are, in California, 4,800 prisoners are put on the street because they don't have the budget to keep them in, strangely enough. So America is in moral freefall. And this whole thing is not about... As any businessman will tell you, Cash flow is a symptom, not a cause. It's a symptom that you're doing some things right. The absence of cash flow means that you haven't done it right. But that's an indicator, not the cause. The root cause in America, because it's in free fall, is because of spiritual warfare. It's totally failing its moral challenges. We have a media masking the truth when its job is to present the truth to the American public. And they are prostitutes chasing dollars that will buy them, as the 2008 election demonstrates so graphically. We have courts that are perverting justice. We have judiciaries that reverse jury trial verdicts, and so on. We have a judiciary that's making laws rather than evaluating them. 
We have schools that are deliberately dumbing down our youth, and I hope that shocks you enough to do your own homework. You'll find it's well documented. We have replaced our traditional heritage with multiculturalism, revisionism, values. You know, it used to be, uh, my, my parents were immigrants, and they didn't really understand a lot about the US, American colleges, but uh, the idea to go to school is to learn right from wrong. That was the mentality of my dad. I remember that. And, uh, and when I got the Naval Academy appointment, he had a little different, he could sort of relate to that. That was different. But anyway, uh, but I mean, the whole idea of education in his mind was to learn right from wrong. And now in our education, is it demonstrates that there is no right. You have your truth, I have my truth. The value of relative is an astonishing retreat from Western civilization. The great books of the Western world were man's quest for truth, a desperate groping for what's true. And today's youth are taught there is no truth. Then why study history? You have your truth, I have mine, you know, is, the, is the nonsense that's being promoted. And get to patriotism. This has been probably the most painful part of my life in recent years. And my wife and I have been through some pretty deep valleys. Uh, we lost our firstborn son, uh, and that was traumatic. Uh, we went through bankruptcy, and we went through some, we've had some ups and downs. But I can tell you candidly, rather strangely perhaps, the most painful time was none of those. The most painful time I've had is, is really started, I guess, at my 50th alumni reunion at the Naval Academy as I began to realize that what I used to regard as patriotism, I now began, I began to evaluate as an obsolete form of idol worship, that it's phony. I feel a sense of betrayal. Those that are products of the long gray line at West Point or the brigade of midship at the Naval Academy are uh, beneficiaries of 150 years of tradition into things that we took seriously, we signed up for, to give our lives to. I now look back and see it as a con job, phony, a shell of things that are now out of date, obsolete. And that's a painful, pa there's a concept that I use called a painful blessing. That sounds like an oxymoron. A painful blessing is the puncturing of a delusion. A five-year-old, when he discovers no Santa Claus, that's painful but essential, right? The Israeli peaceniks years ago discovered, finally, that their enemies don't want peace. And that was a, a, a maturation, a waking up, if you will, of that segment of the population. Most Israelis recognize today that the problem is that their adversaries don't want peace. Well, the other thing for some of us, myself and some of my classmates, is the realization that much of what we signed up for as thinking we were patriotic, we were just chasing a myth that has, that is, that is, that has expired, if you will. So that's a, we're not Democrats or Republicans, we're monarchists today, so to clarify that a little bit. So the real problem, you know, you look, is, is, is the real problem, uh, problem in America the military? You know, some people are very concerned because most of the power in the, in the military has been now relegated to the uh, overt communication, uh, overt uh, combat people. You know, it's the SEAL Team 6, it's the Rangers, it's the, these special groups that operate undercover. It's, you know, you can go to war with a country without declaring war. You slip in the special ops guys, they're in and they out and they accomplish what they do and that's been, that's increasingly become a way of life, strangely enough. Some people are concerned about that. Well, what about politi our po politics? Politics have become unaccountable and totally corrupt. There's no, I, I had the privilege of uh, uh, sitting on a board with Bill Simon. Bill Simon was the former Secretary of Treasury. Uh, he, had, he, he, uh, he wrote a book uh, when, when he was Secretary of Treasury called A Time for Truth, in which he demonstrates why the United States is irrevocably out of control, simply because there's no accountability. The people that control the budgets, the legislatures, and the legislatures themselves are not accountable. They're just worried about their two-year re-election cycle. So... And, uh, and on, on top of all of that, we have the entitlement mentality. Everybody feels they're entitled to whatever. Not as a privilege or not something you achieve, but something that you're entitled to. And that mentality has pervaded the whole culture. And so the financial results are obvious. The debts are driven beyond control. Simply, completely. But the real root of all of this is outlawing the presence of God. That's no longer in our society. The, the, if you look, I could show you 84 charts of social indicators on America 
that up until 1960 were improving slightly, but on the right in the right trend. T, uh, you know, teenage uh, uh, pregnancy. There's all there's 84 different indicators, and they were all improving up till about 1960-62. And every one of them has the same shape. At about that time, they start declining, and they're plunging down ever since. And uh, what happened in those particular years? That's when we had the Supreme Court outlaw public prayer. That's when we outlawed the presence of God in the public schools and, on, and, and all the other derivative aspects of that. And uh, so the, uh, we even at the, just a few weeks ago found that God excluded, deliberately excluded from the platform of the primary political party in, the Amer- in America. And, uh, you know, that, I applaud the clarity. Somehow that removed any pretense of what that party stood for. You now have pastors preaching from pulpits that any Christian can't in good conscience be a member of the Democratic Party. There are people that, that's controversial, obviously, but I, I applaud the clarity of the issue. So that leads me to a key topic that we need to understand, because we discover as we start studying governments and cultures and nations, that God has several different wraths that we find in the Scripture. And I want to focus on the abandonment wrath. As I mentioned last night in the question and answers, there's two, when I have a question and answer period across the United States in large audiences, there's two questions that always come up. Where's the United States in prophecy? They always, there's somebody that always used to ask that. And why hasn't God judged America? Well, the, the United States in prophecy question is easy to dismiss. Most of the books that have been written about that are wrong and easily provably so. And uh, the main players eschatologically in the Bible are very well identified, and the U.S. is not among them. So you, from that, there's a whole other bunch of discussions. But the other question that accompanies that, uh, the, this kind of thing by those that are more spiritually uh, uh, sensitive is why hasn't God judged America? That's a good question. And uh, that's been echoed many times. Uh, Billy Graham had this wonderful soundbite some decades ago now. He says, if God doesn't judge America, he'll have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. That's a great soundbite. It really nails it, if you will. And, uh, but it's interesting, you'll discover that even Thomas Jefferson back in 1781 said essentially the same kind of a thing. He said, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and that his justice cannot sleep forever. Thomas Jefferson had those concerns back then, interestingly enough. And so so while we're chewing on this, I can't resist including the ancient words of a centuries-old poem that haunt me. They're carved in a Gothic medieval alphabet on a towering ornate cathedral door right in the heart of a small town in Germany. And if you translate it into modern English, the words take a form of a frightening poem. And here's what the poem says. You call me eternal, and then do not seek me. You call me fair, and then do not love me. You call me gracious, and then do not trust me. You call me just, then do not fear me. You call me life, then do not choose me. You call me light, and then do not see me. You call me Lord, and then do not respect me. You call me master, then do not obey me. You call me merciful, then do not thank me. You call me mighty, then do not honor me. You call me noble, then do not serve me. You call me rich, then do not ask me. You call me Savior, then do not praise me. You call me Shepherd, then do not follow me. You call me the way, and then do not walk with me. You call me wise, and then do not heed me. You call me Son of God, then do not worship me. When I abandon you, then do not blame me. (laughs) Heavy stuff. 
Well, good morning and welcome back to our conference on weathering the coming storm. And uh, we hope you had a good rest after last night's session. Hope you slept well on that disturbing news. But uh, we are here for the second session on uh, the uh, <laughs> the second session on the national predicament. We talked about the glo- I took a global perspective yesterday, but now we're going to focus on the national predicament. We're just going to zero right on down, as you can tell from your program. And so uh, uh, we will be entering, of course, the Word of God in this presentation, and we always want to do that armed with His presence and with prayer. So let's bow our hearts. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the privilege of being right here. We know, Father, that in your kingdom there are no accidents, no coincidences, that we're all here by your divine appointment. So it's our prayer, Father, that your purpose would be accomplished in each of our lives. In this coming hour, we commit this hour and ourselves into your hands. In the name of Yeshua. Hold in a minute. Edward Gimmon, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, classic, most of you are familiar with. Uh, Toynbee's study of history back in 34, and Jode in 36, and then uh, Jim Nelson Black, When Nations Die in 1994. The, what's interesting, if you study each of these, you'll discover the conclusions are quite consistent. No surprises, pretty straightforward. I'll use Jim Black's summary as the summary of all of them. There's social decay, which is usually a crisis of lawlessness. That's different than breaking the law, the fact that the laws are ineffectual the loss of economic discipline, and rising bureaucracy. These things seem painfully familiar, don't they? Sounds like it's out of an editorial of today's newspaper. Uh, Cultural decay, the decline of education. It's astonishing to discover that the decline of education is not accidental or mismanagement, it's by design. I hope you don't believe that and check it out. You have to for that yourself. The weakening of cultural foundations, the loss of respect for traditional values. It's amazing to discover how the Bible, from cover to cover, admonishes, it said, don't move the ancient landmark. And it's not talking about property landmark, it's an idiom, a metaphor for much broader commitments, that there's a a comfort, a a stability and tradition that is is constructive. And the loss of respect, (laughs) and of course that apathy then leads to dependency. And even in America, with all its pride of so many other things, over 50% of the population is on the dole with the government in some way or another. There's an entitlement mentality that has taken over the culture. And uh, that, ha- that has disastrous consequence, which of course leads back into bondage. That closes the cycle. That cycle throughout history usually takes about two centuries. Give or take a little, about 200 years is the typical cycle. And that's the cycle in America. It's a, and it's a little overdue in a sense. So, have you ever wondered why governments always seem to tend toward corruption? That's a phenomenon we observe. And as a systems engineer, I never understand it until I close the loop, if you will. You see, why are we surprised? Governments have always loved crises, right? They provide the rationale for increasing budgets and bureaucracies subjugating the liberties of the population. That's what these things, that's why they're useful to governments. You can, if you, if you have a, a crisis, that gives you an excuse to increase budgets and also to steal freedoms from the population. In fact, you notice when new dictators take over a country, they almost always traditional values accompanies the fall of nations. And of course, the real root of all of this is moral decay. The rise of immorality. We're going to talk a little bit about that as we go. The decay, of course, of religious belief of whatever kind. And uh, the valuing of human life goes along with this. These are fundamentals that uh, that authors have noted throughout the centuries. Alexander Tyler speaks of the cycle of nations in a way that I think is so descriptive I, I just have to indulge in it. People start in bondage, and while in bondage they attain some measure of spiritual faith. That spiritual faith leads to courage. And from that courage, they can attain at least some level of liberty. And that liberty then leads to abundance. That's a pattern. And that certainly is the profile of America. the, the, The liberty there led to an abundance that became the envy of the world. Watch out for that 
Watch out for envy. It's dangerous. From that abundance, what happens? Well, you pretty soon get to complacency. And from that complacency, it degenerates into apathy. And I'm, I'm fond of quoting this. I go down the street in America and ask somebody, what do you think the biggest problem is in America? Is it, is it uh, ignorance or is it uh, apathy? And he'll say, I don't know and I don't care. Our kinsman redeemer, our reigning king, we thank you, Father. For our Redeemer indeed, in whose name we commit all these things. Amen. He promises that where two or three are gathered together in the midst of us, and we, value, we just welcome that, value that, and trust Him to deal with some very troublesome issues. Uh, one reason we put this conference together uh, is the urgency. We clearly are on the threshold of a storm. And we say that broadly, no matter where you are in the world, you'll be impacted by the events that we're dealing with. And so we're going to, we focused on the broader horizon as a warm up last night. We're now going to spend on the, uh, we're going to focus on the national perspective here, if we may. And so we're going to talk about the life cycle of nations. Many people don't realize that nations have a life cycle. They start and they go through a cycle and they end. And, uh, we're going, we want to understand the nature of the fall of nations and distinguish between the symptoms and the real cause in all of that. Life cycle of nations, it's interesting how that has been studied and studied and studied through the centuries and the conclusions are pretty much identical. Uh, Alexander Tyler back in 1770 published the cycle of democracy and we'll, we'll dwell on his mo- 